Welcome to the Iberian HS and the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science webinar series within organized within the Heritage Science Academy. We have two really interesting presentations of user related of access related projects within the Iberian HS uh, project today. And these are very diverse and have used different facilities uh, within the research infrastructure. This uh, webinar series is uh, in 2023 organized together with the Joint Programming Initiative Culture of Heritage. Without further ado, I'd like to I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Ina Reiche, to take uh, to take the the stage. Ina is a research is research director at the French National Research Center (CNRS) and director of the joint team of the Research Federation New Anglais with the Center for Research and Restoration of the French Museum C2 RMF in Paris. Her interdisciplinary research background is in analytical chemistry, material sciences, art, and prehistory. She specialized in research on ancient pigments, as well as biominerals such as ivory and corals, using non-invasive analytical and imaging methods. Since her position at the, at the head of the Rathgen Research Laboratory at the National Museums in Berlin, between 2014 and 19, she has been actively involved in the research infrastructure Iperion CH, as well as Iperion HS and IRIS, and especially in the access to large scale facilities in the framework of FixLab. To our online audiences, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in order to ask questions, which I will read out loud at the end of the webinar. Over to you, Ina. Uh, thank you very much, Mattia, for this kind introduction. Hello, everybody. I am very happy to be invited today to share my experience as a user of the FixLab, FixLab National Transnational Access. Within this access, we performed measurements at the new Aglaé external microfocus beamline of the particle accelerator Aglaé of Paleolithic ivory artifacts. In this presentation, I will present the joint work performed on the famous Lionman mammoth ivory statue. This work has been performed by a team of people composed of a prehistorian, Kurt Berberger, from the Museum of Ulm, heritage scientists as me, together with the new Aglae access team. In this project, uh, we are interested into archaeological objects dating back to the Orignation period. The Orignation is a key period at the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic. It corresponds to the arrival of the modern humans in Europe, in Eurasia, precisely. Uh, one of the region which is very rich in uh, archaeological sites with ornation layers uh, is uh, the Swabian Alp in southwestern Germany. And in different cave sites, we several uh, important archaeological finds made of mammoth ivory were found, such as these uh, animal figurines and even female figurines figurines, for instance, the one from Holefels. There's also, for instance, the horse from Vogelherd and also the famous uh, lion man from Hohenstein Stadel cave. The lion man sculpture was recognized in 1969. Actually, it's a figure which is half man or half, half human and half an animal corresponding to a cave lion. And Joachim Hahn, a famous prehistor German prehistorian, recognized the figure uh, after its reconstruction reconstru uh, from many several ivory fragments. There have also been new excavations in the, between 2009 and 2011, and a new restoration and assembly of the figure uh, shows it 
as we see it today, as a very beautiful and very tall uh, ivory statue, uh, like the lion man. So it is a very important object because of its age, it's dating back according to uh, the carbon-14 dating of the archaeological layer to 40,000 to 35,000 years BP. It is today the world's oldest known animal human sculpture, and it's also the largest figure of its time with a height of about 31 centimeters. It is the lion man is considered as a cult object because of its archaeological context. It is also an art object, the first one. It needs to be produced. Uh, the time needed to be produced to produce such an object is was quite long. It, uh, according to experimental archaeology, it took about 360 hours to produce uh, the lion man, and also the specificity. specificity of its location, so it was found in a cave site, and also the fact that traces of used ware were found on the object make it a very important cult object. So it is today conserved, uh, kept in the Museum of Ulm, but fortunately we also have very much information about its archaeological context because of the several excavations since World War II. And Beside the statue, we have many loose ivory fragments from the same cave, from similar layers. And we also have, interestingly, another ivory tusk, which is possibly the uh, other tusk of the same animal from which the lion man sculpture was, what was produced. When we want to study the, the chemistry of this, of this object, there are many questions. Um, that are interesting to be to be asked, and, and within this project, we wanted to get further insi insights thanks to chemical analysis on the chemical composition of the lion man. Because as I told you, the lion man is composed actually of three hundred individual ivory fragments. So we want to know if this chemical composition is homogeneous. So if this uh, assembly is is actually uh, quite correct. Then we wanted to know if there's any connection between the other mammoth tusks found in the archaeological layers and the lion man sculpture. And of course, because there are many other loose ivory fragments, we wanted to know if we can establish a link between the different fragments and the lion man statue. Furthermore, on a, a larger European scale, we wanted to know if there is the possibility to define a site specific composition of the mammoth ivory from this cave site. And if we can distinguish this, these types of ivory from those of, from other Oranesian sites in Europe. Because of the importance and the fact that this, this is a very unique object, only non-destructive examination me methods can be used for the study. And because also um, ivory is a composite material composed of an organic and a mineral fraction. So it's basically composed of collagen and hydroxyapatite. Um, we needed a method, a non-invasive method that allows us to get as much as information on the chemical composition of the object at the same time. Usually you could use X-ray fluorescence analysis, but in this case, the sensitivity is not so high for low Z elements. Uh, and we also needed a very sensitive method for trace elements. And that's why the iron beam analytical methods seem to us uh, very well suited to study the object, to get information on the chemical composition ranging from light elements uh, to uh, uh, heavy Z elements. So we perform, we use the possibilities of the uh, external microbeam setup at the new Aglae uh, accelerator at the C2 RMF in Paris. So we could combine proton induced X ray emission with proton induced gamma ray emission and Rutherford backscattering in order to get non invasive uh, um, um, results on the ivory composition. In previous work, that on other ivory artifacts that has been performed during the former uh, European infrastructures Charisma and Iperion CH, we had uh, already preliminary investigations on the characteristic elements of the mineral phase of ivory. 
major elements such as calcium, phosphorus, and also magnesium are characteristic of ivory and can be used as distinctive, as a distinctive criterion to discriminate ivory from other bone artifacts. We also identified um, elements such as iron and manganese that are elements that are generally uptaken during diagenetic processes in ancient ivory artifacts. And we could also identify trace elements that can be considered as basically biogenic, so they can be site-specific or uh, ivory-specific uh, because they are very well preserved and they are linked to the um, environmental conditions where the animal lived at that time. So this, these elements are, for instance, zinc, strontium, and bromine. And knowing this, we, we could perform the analysis of the object within the fixed step access. So we, we, we wrote together a proposal which was evaluated together uh, with the curator. And then we brought the ivory fragments, the task, and also the uh, alignment to the Ag Aglae facility in order to uh, perform the measurements. So in order to show you uh, uh, how we installed the object in front of the accelerator. We prepared uh, a small movie of one minute that shows of you how, how we work. And this movie was um, mounted by a filmmaker, Joel Olivier, for us. I go back to the presentation. I hope that, um, can you see it? No, not, not yet. Not yet, okay, just, can you see it now? Okay, thank you. Okay, I put it in the presentation. But now we can't hear you, Lina, I'm afraid. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, now it's it's working again. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's always um, com more complicated when you show me. So um, I hope that you get an idea how we perform such analysis that uh, needs to be done very careful with a lot of preparation when you bring such an important object to a research facility. 
So we studied the object, but also, of course, the, the same procedure was applied to the study of the ivory fragments and of the task. Um, and then the presentation is not working. Oh, yes, okay. And so then the chemical analysis was performed, spectra were treated, and uh, we used the characteristic trace elements in order to check the homogeneity of the of the composition of the different fragments of the sculpture. As you can see, there is a small scattering, but there's a there's a big zoom into the composition uh, of the trace elements, the strontium, oxy, uh, strontium oxide and the zinc oxide. And we can see that the alignment is actually uh, representing a, a, a group uh, which is only affected by some alterations or some modifications of the chemical composition by deposited manganese oxides or by sediment that is uh, deposited on the surface of the ivory. We are performing surface analysis, so non-invasive analysis, so that's why the chemical composition of the surface is very much influenced by uh, the presence of sediments of, of by alteration process. But all, to get, all in all, we can consider that the lion man has a quite homogeneous composition. When we look at the loose uh, ivory fragments, some of them are are considered by the archaeologists to be belonging to the lion man, but they couldn't be added to it, and they fit well within this group. And there are other fragments that are clearly coming from another archaeological layer, and within our plots, we can differentiate them clearly from the group of the lion. There is also a group uh, uh, which is undetermined, and in this case, um, the, the fragments are very similar to those to the composition of the linemen so that we can consider them as also being part of the linemen uh, sculpture. When we compare the data of the linemen with the data obtained on the Ivan test, there are also some differences, but the, the groups are really close and we find the same type of elemental correlations of strontium and zinc so that we can, can consider that the task is really very similar to the ivory of the linemen. So this means that it is consistent to think that the task is also coming from the same archaeological context and it can be coming from the same animal, but this is something we cannot prove with our method. When we look at our data on a more regional scale or a larger European scale, we can see that the ivory fragments the chemical composition of the trace elements that are characteristic of the region, uh, they are uh, the elemental uh, ca ca characteristics of the Hohenstein Stahl ivories is very close to the other ones from the uh, Swabian Alps. So this is very consistent with our finds and it, these ivories can be differentiated from other ivories from France, for instance, or even from Germany, from Northern Germany or from Russia. But then we also wanted to know if we can differentiate ivories from different valleys within one region, so with a finer scale. And we can see that, in, in, in fact, we can identify ivories from Hohenstein Stahl and differentiate them from other ivories from another valley in the same region. So we have a really um, good differentiation of, of the provenance of different ivories even within one uh, region. So to summarize my presentation, I hope that I could show you that within the fixed lab access, we are able to uh, perform really interesting analysis that are not, that are only possible with large scale facilities. We need very high um, elemental select uh, sensitivity in order to differentiate different types of ivory. We could show for such important objects, such as the lion that its composition of its ivory is consistent. We can also define a sort of a fingerprint of ivories from different regions, but we cannot go uh, as far as to say that the, the ivory is coming from one animal. For such kinds of questions, further analysis uh, are needed. We also want to continue this research and we continue the 
evaluation of our data. For instance, we also have PGIL RBS data to be uh, evaluated. We also combined our investigation, at least on the fragments, with some measurements at the Synchrotron Soleil, at the Puma beamline, because the Puma beamline, we can perform XRF me measurements with a higher uh, elemental sensitivity for heavier trace elements. And we also look at other parts of the figure, such as the manganese oxide dendrite. So within all our project, we had uh, established a completely non-invasive method thanks to several techniques that can, can be combined using different axes such as Soleil uh, and the Puma beamline and the new Aglae facility. And we could also think of ac further access to objects that cannot be transported uh, through the molar access. Um, I thank all the colleagues that have contributed to this ongoing work, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ina. This was a, a really excellent example of access, and uh, it must have been wonderful to work on an object like that. Um, if the audience has questions, please do write them down in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. I'd now like to introduce our uh, second speaker. He is uh, Roman Thomas, a lecturer in early modern art history at the University of Paris, Nanterre. He's interested in the history of art of the Netherlands and their Germanic countries in the 16th and 17th centuries. He's also developing a material and interdisciplinary approach to art in the early modern period with a particular interest in color. He's the principal investigator of the Auru project of the analysis of gold and its uses as a painting material, as well as the Patrimoniochromies project about heritage and color. He's also deputy scientific coordinator of the Equipox Plus Espadon project. Romain, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for this nice presentation. And I'm very honored to uh, present this uh, project uh, uh, and, and my, the access of my team to the Arc Lab facility. So I am now going to share my screen. Uh, are you seeing it? Yes. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, so the uh, Our Room project uh, has been funded by the Agence Nationale de la Recherche, uh, the French uh, Research National Agency, uh, uh, since a few months. Uh, it is a project. Ah, uh, there is a problem with. Uh, sorry, I can't. Uh, ah, yes. Um, so the, this project um, is um, about the study of uh, gold as a material for easel painting in Western Europe in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, and the, the main work uh, is to gather an original corpus of artworks and to analyze it from a threefold perspective, historical, technical and optical. This is an interdisciplinary project. It is involving art historians, curators, conservators, chemists, physicists, but also data scientists. And uh, some of the questions we are inquiring uh, are the following. How the study of matter, for instance, gold, uh, techniques and material productions can contribute to the historical understanding of artworks or how to look at paintings, sometimes those paintings uh, very well known, in a new way by considering the specific gloss of gold and the importance of the lighting. Uh, here you have three examples of paintings dating from the 17th century, uh, which uh, are made with uh, gold at some point, uh, and the three of them are made by great artists, uh, worldly known uh, from the uh, Dutch Republic, uh, Rembrandt, Vermeer, and also uh, Peter Sanredam, which has painted the uh, view of the Maria Kerk in Utrecht, which is in the middle of your screen. 
And here you can see a large amount of uh, gold leaf used with uh, um, glazes uh, on the top of the, the gold layer. For the other paintings, uh, the, the painters have used gold in uh, different techniques. Uh, Rembrandt has used uh, gold leaf over uh, a copper uh, slate uh, and then painted above it and Vermeer has uh, painted on a canvas and used a, a tiny uh, pitch of gold uh, to uh, represent um, uh, a detail of the chair. Uh, so here you have three great masters of the 17th century, uh, three different uh, techniques and three different kinds of iconography as well. Uh, so it's um, those are three paintings that are uh, quite uh, unusual, uh, at least in the mind of art historians, because gold as a painting material is meant uh, to be uh, uh, left behind since the 15th century. This is the actual uh, um, iconography, the, sorry, the uh, actual uh, historiography. Uh, in the 16th and uh, 17th century, though, uh, gold is still uh, used, uh, of course, less and less with time, uh, but uh, those examples are uh, a proof that uh, it is uh, still used. And uh, this is a period of uh, really great interest for uh, historians and art historians, because the painting techniques are uh, evolving a lot. Uh, the, uh, wood is uh, replaced uh, little by little by the use of canvas, uh, but also the tempera painting is replaced uh, by the oil painting. Uh, and there are also new supports that are being used by painters, such as uh, copper or uh, stone as well. Uh, the uh, art history is also uh, moving apart from the, the techniques uh, because um, painters develop new iconographies, uh, landscapes, uh, lots of um, uh, pro uh, profane uh, scenes, etc. And uh, the cultural and social context as, uh, are moving, are evolving as well. Uh, gold, for instance, um, is more and more present uh, in Europe because of uh, the gold from Africa and later from America. And uh, also gold is more and more present in the heads of Europeans uh, if we think to uh, myth like the El Dorado, for instance. So the Our Room project has got uh, several scientific objectives uh, that are uh, correlated with uh, the organization in work packages. Uh, the first uh, aim is to gather this unexplored corpus in European collections and to study it with the fundamental methods of art history with the help of written sources. The second uh, work package uh, consists of studying uh, the gilding techniques painter used all over Europe. Uh, and to contribute to a history of the techniques of painting. So it, it is an interdisciplinary work package. Uh, the third work package is inter interdisciplinary as well. It uh, consists of studying the optical properties of gilding, uh, the color of the gilding, the gloss of gilding. And uh, the uh, WP4 is uh, uh, concerned with data management. So it is a work on progress with uh, the project itself with last, will last until 2025. And here I will only uh, present you uh, a, a few uh, examples and it will not be um, definitive uh, result or definitive conclusions. Uh, the visits to art labs uh, we have made with my team uh, is strongly related with the WP2, the work package 2, uh, which means that we were uh, mostly inquiring uh, to gilding techniques. So we were uh, looking uh, for documentation concerning the gilding techniques used in the identified paintings. And uh, the secondary objectives is to, uh, um, to gather uh, the corpus. Uh, that means to search for any easel painting, whatever its support, wood, canvas, stone, or copper, 
and whatever its technique, tempera, oil, and so on, uh, where the painter has used gold. We have made, uh, with my team, uh, four uh, research stays uh, in the uh, ACLAB laboratories, uh, two in the National Gallery, uh, three days each, and uh, one in the Rexins uh, for a cultural Erfurt, one in the Opificio delle Pietre Dure in uh, 2021 and 2022. And the team was composed of two art historians, Valentina Ristova and myself, one physical chemist, Anson Leo, and uh, one conservator, uh, an independent conservator, Marie Dubost. Uh, our activities during the stays were uh, meeting with the team and the tour of the laboratory and conservation center, and uh, it has been the occasion of uh, uh, meeting also experts uh, uh, and uh, to discuss about our project. And for instance, uh, uh, we had a very interesting conversation with uh, uh, a colleague from the Delft University uh, about the Oranjesal, which is a, a, a historical monument uh, in the uh, in the Netherlands, uh, dating from the middle of the 17th century, uh, where uh, there are lots of uh, mural uh, of. Uh, um, yeah, you know, mural painting on uh, wood and where gold has been uh, used uh, largely. Uh, and Marit um, um, van Eikema-Holmes, the colleagues we could discuss with, um, made an extremely um, interesting and helpful analysis of the uh, Oranjezal and the way gold was uh, used inside this um, uh, monument. Uh, we also could review the documentations, uh, scientific analysis reports, uh, images, conservation reports, scientific literature, and in the National Gallery particularly, we could also, because it is also a museum, uh, uh, go uh, through the uh, PDF uh, catalogs, which uh, made the, uh, the search uh, much uh, quicker, and uh, also we could see a few few of the paintings that are uh, in the museum stores and have a close examination of them. And in uh, Amsterdam, in the RCE, we could also uh, perform with Ineke Joosten uh, uh, same analysis. Uh, the achievements of the, for the project of uh, those uh, stays are uh, the um, uh, discovery of around uh, 40 uh, artworks uh, on which we do have found some scientific and conservation reports in the archives. And uh, those artworks, uh, those 40 artworks, uh, are mainly related to the first half of the 16th century. Uh, they concern uh, mostly the German lands, Italian peninsula, and Flanders in the 16th century. And the techniques concerned were uh, gold on modern player, gold on ball, but also shell gold. And the supports here, uh, the, the support um, used by the painters of these artworks uh, is mainly wood. Uh, we had also, um, we, we could also uh, find many uh, informations about the composition of layers because in the documentation we could find uh, many samples that had been analyzed and the color of the underlayer, which is of uh, interest for us in the project, was also mentioned in those uh, reports. Uh, and our um, additional interest for the Aurum project in general and uh, um, some results we are going to use uh, for the, the following uh, of our uh, analysis. Uh, and I would like to show you two examples uh, here. Uh, first, uh, some of the artworks uh, are paintings with a high value from an art historical point of view. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the example is uh, this painting after Hieronymus Bosch, uh, which is entitled Christ, Christ Crown with Thorns, and which is uh, so from an anonymous artist from the 16th century after the great uh, master Bosch. 
Uh, and Ineke Houston could perform uh, an, a, a same analysis of a sample uh, because uh, there had been in 1969 uh, a complete analysis of the uh, of this object of this artwork and a uh, sample at that time had been uh, taken and uh, Ineke Houston could perform uh, a same analysis of uh, this sample and then uh, uh, at that occasion we could um, uh, acknowledge that uh, the under layer, uh, the, the technique, uh, sorry, of uh, the gilding technique is uh, gold on mordant layer, which is quite interesting for that kind of iconography, because if we compare this uh, to a color uh, image of another similar artwork, uh, we can see here that there is a gold ground that has been uh, represented by the artist. And uh, the, uh, this uh, kind of imagery with gold ground is uh, less and less used uh, at that period. Actually, um, the, the historiography says that after 1550, uh, gold grounds are no more used. And uh, in the rest of the project, we could uh, see that uh, in a few areas in Europe, for instance, in Germany, in South Germany, there are lots and lots of go around until the uh, uh, years uh, 1520s. And this is uh, an example. Uh, of the 16th century, late uh, or middle of the 16th century, so quite uh, late. And the fact that uh, the, um, the technique uh, is gold on mordant layer is uh, extremely interesting as well, because in the Middle Ages, it was uh, mostly uh, gold on ball that had been used to uh, make uh, gold grounds. The second uh, example is uh, this uh, painting by Niccolo Pisano uh, that is. Uh, um, conserved in the National Gallery and uh, the scientific uh, report uh, says that uh, this is a painting made on unprimed canvas, which is quite uh, rare uh, nowadays uh, in the museums because it's a kind of technique that uh, um, evolves uh, very badly in time and so there are very few uh, items like that. And uh, there is also a great use of gold in uh, that kind of artworks. It is shell gold, so powder gold that has been used as a normal uh, color and not a uh, gold leaf. And this is also of great interest for the, the rest of the project. So basically, uh, we could uh, gather uh, lots of informations about uh, artworks that will serve uh, as a comparison for the, uh, the future analysis we are going to perform with the rest of the team of the Our Room project uh, into the collections of French museums. Uh, and uh, we are going to um, uh, go to uh, two new um, institutions uh, in the following months. So Instituto del Patrimonio Cultural de España in June and the Kikirpa in uh, September. So uh, I would like in the name of my team to uh, thanks a lot all the Hyperion, HS and Arc Lab uh, and the three in institutions we've visited so far, all their teams and particularly Catherine Higgit and Marika Spring in the National Gallery, Monica Galeotti in the Opificio delle Pietre Dure and Ineke Yosten in the RCE. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ramon, and thank you both speakers, actually, for having presented your case studies, your access projects. Uh, both were uh, fantastically interesting, and thank you for following the brief. I'd also like to thank uh, Jana Striova for having put together the program for today. This, uh, both presentations will be available as YouTube, as, as, YouTube, uh, as a YouTube video uh, and can be viewed at a later date as well. Now, before we go to the next, uh, to the question and answer session, I'd just like to very quickly uh, share with you the uh, next, uh, uh, the, an announcement of the next lecture, 
This is a lecture in our lecture series, in the HS Academy lecture series. Um, and this will be given by Michela Botticelli. Um, and the title of this webinar, the title of this lecture is Ethical Sampling from Seed to Fruit and Beyond. This is going to be really interesting and it will look at how the ICON, so the Institute of Conservation's ethical sampling um, methodology has been taken up by professionals.